Hello and welcome to Money Control Special on Managing Market Turns. My guest today is Nandan Chakravarti of DAM Capital. He's a powerhouse of knowledge. He has a keen sense of economic history. And of course, he has put in a long time in the market. Nandan, thank you so much for your time today. Anyone, Nandan, who has put in as many years as uh, you have definitely knows that the four most dangerous terms in the market is this time it's different, right? Uh, in what ways do you see this market cycle as being different from all the market cycles we have seen in the past? And are there any subtle differences that you see that can make a meaningful difference to the outcome as we move forward? So there's always the controversy on in a bad time globally, if you are the highest growth major economy, as hmm. has happened in the past, then is it good for you or is it bad for you? Hmm. So that really, you know, affects the whole thing. So that is one. But how is the globe doing versus, you know, how you're doing? The second major difference between this and all previous markets is that the the uh, retail participation has been tremendous. Right. As a matter of fact, if you see SIPs, which are a very sticky part of uh, uh, funds flow, domestic funds flow, is 75% of the uh, April inflows in, in all mutual funds. Correct. So it's a very large chunk. Right. So I think that's a second difference. The uh, 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 third difference is the fact that, you know, we have uh, an interest rate increase out here with the inflation differential not being as much of a worry hmm. if, uh, as in the West. The inflation is a much bigger problem in the West than in uh, India. Right. Inflation affecting our demand is the, is the issue here. Uh, the, the fourth problem is the fact that before this crisis, we were already weak in demand. Hmm. So capex has been low, demand has been low. So there are four, I think, main differences between this and previous uh, market cycles. Hmm. 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 Nandan, this is the best that we have seen in terms of both uh, corporate and bank balance sheets. Uh, but the private capex somehow is not really uh, taking off. What do you see as the trigger for that to take off? See, the magic word is trigger. Hmm. There has to be a trigger for it to happen. And there sometimes there are multiple triggers. Hmm. So, you know, just because you're a marriageable age and you've got a good education and so on and a good job doesn't mean you're going to get married the next day. Hmm. So, yes, the foundations for CapEx are in place in terms of the corporate balance sheets being in place. The corporate balance sheets are in place because they're not spending. So, it's chicken and egg. Right. So, uh, I think for CapEx to go up in India, there are two or three things which, I, which I'll mention. One is the fact that, you know, demand has been weak. Hmm. And demand has been weak for a number of different factors. You know, uh, your SMEs have got hit. The number of jobs uh, have got hit. So there's low demand uh, locally. And because of the global problem that's got exacerbated, that there's, you know, not too much of demand uh, globally either. Right. So, and the macro is worsening for CapEx because of higher inflation and interest. Correct. Having said that, the nature of CapEx in India has changed. So the two or three differences, one is that right now it's being led mostly by passenger vehicles and metals. Hmm. So those are the main two drivers of CapEx. With the third, a slightly shorter leg being the uh, PLIs that have been announced, hmm. which are largely in the export related sectors, hmm. import sub or other import, uh, import substitution sectors. Hmm. So hmm. that's one difference of CapEx, which is it's, you know, it's very... Uh, it's not broad based. It's just, you know, these two sectors. Right. The second difference in CapEx is that there have been a large number of smaller industries which have gone into CapEx. You know, you talk about sugar, you talk about auto ancillaries, you talk about textiles, right. uh, things like that, which have gone into uh, CapEx in the last few, five years. So which is why you see the order books of some hmm. of the CapEx beneficiaries not doing too badly, hmm. like Thomax hmm. and all. Right. Uh, on the other hand, the main drivers of CapEx in the past, which is energy, yeah. which is oil and gas and power, hmm. uh, basically have uh, uh, have not moved up. Correct. So there is a pregnant period because, you know, both for uh, oil uh, oil and gas as well as uh, LS power, you will have renewables coming in, which will take a little bit of time and that will be the huge jump. Hmm. For example, NTPC. Hmm. Is, uh, is going to basically the same CapEx, 60 gigawatts, which it has in coal-based, is going right. to be replicated in renewables. Correct. Similarly, for the you know oil sector, Reliance is basically going to give its CapEx in renewables rather than you know uh, uh, the traditional, uh, this thing that it has now. So that will take time. 
The third is a fact that the nature of technology has basically changed the nature of employment of capex. So you see a lot of capex in manufacturing hmm. coming from productivity improvements, hmm. you know, automation and things like that. Hmm. Similarly, if you see in construction, you, you require less labor than before. Hmm. So these are the three differences, main differences in the capex of tomorrow versus the capex of yesterday. Sure, sure. And how do you see this uh, playing out, Nandan? I mean, how long do you think uh, will it take for private capex to really come back in a meaningful way? Because this is really happening in bits and pieces, right? like you rightly pointed out. It's in uh, some isolated sectors. But that large, uh, uh, you know, capex, uh, private capex move that can make a meaningful difference to growth, that's not happening yet. So I don't see it coming this year, financial year. Hmm. Probably by the next financial year, we will see power also coming back. Hmm. And uh, the renewable energy part of it, from both oil and gas, there is reliance and so on. The, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention another point, is a, a lot of the capex that we see in the emerging sectors, uh, renewable energy and so on, is going to be imported. So hmm. that may not have as much spin-off spin benefits into uh, you know Indian industry like it had earlier, hmm. so that's the other point to you know also keep in mind. Hmm. So having said that, to you know come back to your question, uh, uh, I, uh, it's only next year, next financial year that I think you'll see the beginnings of uh, private capex sure. because by that time I expect Indian demand at least, if not you know global demand, to start uh, moving up because there has been a long enough pregnant period hmm. for Indian demand. Right. In fact, that that is exactly what I was coming to in this quarter, uh, quarter four. You really didn't see uh, any effect on demand. We saw inflationary pressures uh, taking away a few basis points from margins and so on. But there has been no demand destruction so far. So over the next two to three quarters, do you see any effect uh, on demand at all? And uh, how meaningful could that be? So, you know, apart from auto, uh, I think in the last quarter, no sector has really been able to pass on prices. Hmm. So, you know, auto has had a few hikes. Hmm. But I think in the next two quarters, the first will be the effect of uh, inflation, which has actually started only in the end of February. So we've had only right. March in the last quarter. Correct. So inflation, a lot of the effect will be in this quarter. Right. So that will have an effect. But we are seeing signs, at least from uh, the con calls that we've had with companies that, you know, they are all planning to, you know, hike hmm. uh, and pass on costs in the next two quarters. Hmm. Hmm. So that play still remains, you know, we're not sure how much they'll be able to pass on, hmm. especially in the most highly affected sectors, like let us say uh, cement. Hmm. And cement, as a matter of fact, for example, you know, South has already increased uh, its prices by 20 rupees per bag recently. Right. So, so there will be, hopefully, some increase in, you know, hikes for uh, cement, similarly for, you know, consumer durables, which has also got affected. Hmm. Uh, there may be some hikes, so we'll have to see. And there will be a lag effect of the interest rate. Hmm. Hmm. So that is the other part of inflation. Hmm. Now, interest rates affect inflation far more in the West than in India because, you know, in the West, uh, the, the uh, consumer wallet has a large amount of mortgages and cars. Right. We don't have that much here. More here is food and crude. Right, right. So uh, it will take a little bit of time for uh, uh, for the interest rate effect. You know, typically they say interest rates affect uh, to affect inflation and therefore demand takes three or four quarters. Hmm, hmm. But remember when I say that the next two quarters are going to be the main impact of inflation. Hmm. Also remember that the stock markets discounted in advance. Correct. So if I say that over the next three or four quarters, you're going to have inflation, the effect of the interest rate uh, impact. Hmm. So the question is that you, you, you have to see how much the market is discounting that in advance and have you already reached a level where you can start a play? Because hmm. people say blood is on the streets and you should invest. I think that's a pretty stupid this thing because is the market low enough for that? So Correct. just because the economy is not doing well doesn't mean that you should start investing. Correct. The market Correct. has to discount it. Correct. So that's the next question. <laughs> that uh, In terms of valuation, you know, we are uh, in one year forward maybe around, like you also point out in your report, around the five-year average in terms of valuation, right? So you say that there isn't that much room for upside. There isn't too much uh, room for uh, downside either. So do you see, but usually if you see uh, 
when the sentiment changes or if there is ma moderation, the markets tend to swing uh, in either direction. Do you see on balance, are there factors that could swing it either ways? Swing the valuation either ways? Yeah. The valuation question is important only for the institutional investor. Right. Having said that, now your ROE, hmm. return on equity of the Nifty, hmm. is at 16%. Hmm. versus the 5-year and 10-year average of 13 to 14%. Hmm. Your average PE is going to be higher than the 5-year average or the 10-year average, your hmm. current PE. Hmm. And this hmm. is mainly because of the high ROE sectors like you know banking and IT, right. which have you know become a larger chunk than in the last few years. Correct, correct. Okay, so, uh, uh, so because of the ROE, you're going to be higher. Having said that, the last 5 years has been a total bubble in growth stocks. Hmm. So, therefore, your 5-year average is not as meaningful as the 10-year average hmm. of your P. Hmm. So, uh, the last uh, 5 years, if you see, if you see all the growth stocks, their PE has been far above, you know, what it was in the last 10 years, it, uh, despite the fact that the demand growth or the EPS growth hmm. has been more or less at par or less than the 10-year average. Hmm. So, multiples have just shot up. Hmm. without the EPS coming in this thing. And this is, you know, growth stock is a good way of investing for professional investors hmm. because you take a clutch of companies and you, you know, every year you see if they're on track and so on. But it's not a, not necessarily a very good, you know, uh, approach for a common man because, you know, you don't have that information right. on hand. Right. On the other hand, if you're a value investor, hmm. the problem is that you can't leave uh, it to your kids hmm. because, you know, every, every two or three years you have to, you know, sell the stock. Hmm. Because when it achieves its value, there's no inherent growth. Correct. So you have to sell the stock. Hmm. So it's you need far more active investing. So that's my call. Uh, basically, you know, to get a to give you a benchmark, the uh, if you use the ten-year average PE hmm. on the Nifty, hmm. and you use the current EPS, current hmm. forward EPS, that is five five twenty three, hmm. hmm. you will get a base Nifty of fifteen thousand. So that is some benchmark on, you know, how low it can get. Hmm. Hmm. And we are, you know, not too far from that. The last few days have been good, but, you know, next few days, let's see what happens. We're not too far from that. And the upside is not clear because as you started uh, your presentation, you know, your first comment was that uh, uh, these quarter four results, right. uh, it has not been too much effect on demand. Right. So unless analysts see some visible signs of hmm. demand slowdown, how are they going to make any forecasts? Hmm. So the current forecasts are not of any use because you don't know the hike in prices, neither hmm. do you know the effect of inflation and interest rates on demand. Hmm. 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 So the upside is indeterminate. Sure. Having said that, there are areas like we pointed out in our report where you, you can make uh, 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 long-term bets if you ignore the next you know six to, uh, six to nine months hmm. where which is uncertain you'll have uh, bets where there are some visible signs of growth hmm. so similarly there are uh, areas which are emerging hmm. so all these areas one can still invest in over the next six months hmm. Hmm. if one keeps you know a barbell structure you hmm. know, like in that you know famous uh, book anti anti fragility of yeah. Nicholas uh, Taleb yeah he said in uncertain times have a barbell structure hmm. so on the short term, for short-term protection for institutional investors, you have the, the, the defensive plays. Hmm. And on the, you know, the other end, you have aggressive plays for those which are for the long term. So hmm. you can time diversify your portfolio. Hmm. Hmm. So explain that a little more. I mean, how do you construct, a, you know, the, the very concept of a barbell structure? And how do you really construct your portfolio around that? So again, this is, you know, what I'm going to talk about now, which is my report is only for institutional investors. Right. So this will not necessarily work for, uh, you know, a personal investor who has different imperatives. Hmm. Uh, for an institutional investor, what I'm saying is uh, uh, the uh, sectors which have got hit the most have been auto and cement. Hmm. Out of which the, the cement outlook for the next six months is not too good. Hmm. And they have not been able to, you know, hike prices much except in the south recently. So we'll have to see how they hike prices and get their margins back into order. Hmm. And also the, the leading companies in cement are fairly ex expensive because of the acquisition. And the, the smaller companies are not so expensive and they are uh, uh, probably targets for acquisition. So there will be some consolidation in the cement industry. So hmm. cement will take some time to play out. And I don't think it has come to the level where it is very cheap. Hmm. On the other hand, auto, 
you are seeing visible signs of a recovery in auto. Hmm. So if you see the passenger vehicle uh, segment, there there has been a seven percent you know MOM growth. If you see the two wheeler segment again after a long time, there's been a recovery. Hmm. And uh, for uh, 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 the commercial vehicle segment, the LCVs have been doing well. The HCVs have paused. Uh, Correct. Correct. So you are seeing an all round uh, recovery uh, from the base in in the auto industry, which is why I'm saying it is visible now. Hmm. Uh, and therefore, one may invest for the long term in in almost all segments of the auto industry. Hmm. Hmm. So that's I think the forward my forwards in the DAM football team, hmm. Hmm. Uh, the strikers. Hmm. If you go to the defenders, hmm. you so have, so uh, so let me understand. So the first category is near term recovery, right? When you say forwards or uh, strikers, they are the near near term recovery candidates. They are near term as well as long term because you have valuation on your side also. Right. So you have a play for the long term also. Sure. And in that category, just sticking to this, uh, you've recommended um, Ashok Leyland uh, TBS Motors, Maruti, I think, Maruti, Maruti right? Maruti. Yeah. So, uh, so conspicuous by absence is Tata uh, Motors. Uh, any particular reason the market seemed to be more hot on that, especially because of the EV play, or is that uh, because of valuations? Uh, is, is that no, no, what in, the in, a, in the football field, when you have to have eleven players, then if they have too many strikers, it gets too aggressive. Hmm. So you, they'll all be bumping into each other and not passing to each other properly. Correct. So correct. you have to have. You know, at the most, normally you have two strikers because hmm. we've been aggressive in this portfolio. Because when this uh, um, uh, report was written, the market was far lower than now. So we have hmm. to be a little more aggressive. So we sure. have three strikers rather than two. So hmm. it's just a question of order. Hmm. So analysts, our analysts, auto analysts likes uh, Tata Motors also, hmm. and there has been some easing of duties in China, which is you know uh, been good for JLA. Right. The question is, he prefers Ashok Leyland because you have an you know global uh, driver for JLA hmm. or Tata Motors, where this is a pure domestic story, where you've been increasing market share as well as being able to hike prices. Right. But he likes Tata Motors also. Sure. Sure. Understood. So, if you look at the defenders, these are specific uh, choices rather than uh, uh, sectors. So, among pharma, we have chosen only Sun Pharma hmm. because you know while pharma is not going to get as affected by IT hmm. uh, 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 by the global uh, slowdown, uh, uh, Sun Pharma in particular hmm. has you know is into specialty drugs, so Correct. its balance sheet is good. And you will be able to Sun Pharma will be able to get more and more you know specialty brands in the US. Hmm. So that's the play on Sun Pharma where the base is covered. You're not going to see you know you're going to see a steady growth hmm. of you know about fifteen percent or so uh, year on year, and you have a decent a reasonable valuation. So hmm. that's Sun Pharma. Tell me a little more yeah. about Sun Pharma, uh, Nandan, because it's been uh, you know a favorable favorite stock for a lot of. Uh, value investors especially because it's at the bottom of the uh, uh, valuation pack but somehow or the other there have been a lot of negative surprises in the past uh, two three years in fact through the covid period also when all the pharma companies uh, went up sun pharma in it you know always had a muted uh, sort of a performance uh, so two things uh, yeah one is the concerns that you talked about you know which were there in the uh, previous quarterly result also yeah uh, uh, those were one offs Hmm, hmm. And they were already known to professional investors, which is right. why the uh, the stock hasn't corrected that much because of. Hmm, hmm, hmm. And if you take the last two years, yes, it's more. There is no magic going to happen in Sun Pharma like it can happen in some of the other pharma stocks, hmm. uh, where you can have a you know blockbuster. Hmm. So some of the uh, other pharma stocks that you've seen go up in the last two years have hmm. had blockbusters. Hmm, hmm. Sun Pharma is not going to give you that because given its size. For it to acquire a company, uh, say in the US or somewhere else, Brazil or you know or whatever, that time or somewhere else, it's going to it has to be a meaningful size, right? Which which is very difficult. So you're not going to see a blockbuster coming out of Sun Pharma, not likely, but may happen. Hmm. So hmm. it's more of a defensive where you have steady growth, you have a balance sheet which you can take more and more acquisitions of brands, hmm. and it is into specialty areas which are not affected by. Not so much affected by you know climatic changes and you know demographic changes and so on. Sure, and there is valuation comfort, of course. There is valuation comfort. comfort. Correct. 
and the second is which i mentioned is apollo hospitals now yeah. this entire sector of healthcare which hmm. whether it's diagnostics or whether it's hospitals hmm. is going to have a massive uh, demand over the next few years Hmm. and because of the you know uh, sp- uh, specific nature of indian insurance as compared to western insurance hmm. the hospitals have a field day hmm. in terms of pricing and so on hmm. and the market is very virgin because of a concentrated nature of our cities unlike right. the west we have hmm. only you know few metro seven or eight you know big metros to speak of where you can get the right skilled doctors and uh, the inflows and uh, so on Hmm. So, uh, so you have a market where, uh, where where the total addressable market is huge, and there are very few players. Hmm. And uh, Apollo Hospitals, in particular, unlike the other players, is pan India, and hmm. it is into every every sector. Correct. It is into diagnostics. It is into pharmacy. Correct. So it's into everything, and all of them are growing. Right. Which is why it's defensive. Hmm. Hmm. And the third defensive, which is the ultimate defender, which I've said, which is the goalkeeper, is NTPC. Hmm. and that uh, you know uh, uh, last two years there has been some growth hmm. and the next two years also we are, we are going to see an higher than average growth so you're going to see a 7% growth rather than a 5% growth hmm. in in the uh, traditional business hmm. which is the coal fired ones hmm. Hmm. Uh, uh, but over the longer term you're going to have only a 5% growth or less in the coal fired ones but you're going to replicate hmm. the entire capacity that you had in uh, coal fired ones with renewable energy right you're going to see that growth and you've seen the tata power renewables yeah uh, uh, this thing also you see renew power azure and the other you know foreign uh, renewable players and if you uh, use that valuation yeah the spin off of uh, ntpc yeah because they mentioned that you know there will be a strategic investor or a ipo or something there will be some spin off right then you're getting it at basically 5p correct the correct so it's correct. cheap is there any uh, you know um, uh, downside to that because uh, this has been clear that ntpc has really been transitioning uh, from uh, thermal to renewable over the last few years in fact it's more competitive than adani uh, in quite a few uh, bids right despite that the market doesn't seem to be buying the story for quite some time now uh, probably because of the perception of uh, you know dominance of thermal all the esg factors and all of that do you really how do you see again like you said earlier what is the trigger is it the spin off that could be the trigger for this uh, valuation to get unlocked yeah it will be the spin off which should be you know as they mentioned 24 months to 36 months so over the next see if something is too near term it already get discounted into the valuation Hmm, hmm. So it's a defensive because valuation is on your side. Hmm. You have the versatile midfield, which is you know you've taken stocks which are very stock specific. So you have as a sector it is banking, hmm, hmm. and otherwise you have you know uh, the retail sector, the pipe sector, and uh, fluorochemicals. Right. So these are specific you know stock specific factors. Otherwise, it's banking, especially the the large four. Right. If right. you want to continue to take market share away from the smaller players as well as the private sector. Hmm. Hmm. How come uh, in banking you picked uh, HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank uh, from the value bias that you generally tend to have? I would have expected you to take um, uh, SBI. Why not? This is the versatile sector. So you neither am I playing defensive nor am I playing aggressive. Hmm. So while you have valuation on your side in SBI, uh, uh, the growth. Uh, is HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank? If you look at you know HDFC Bank, hmm. uh, it's it's a leader in almost every uh, sector hmm. in its operation, hmm. and it will gain from you know the the increase in interest rates because hmm. you know its corporate book is hmm. basically floating rate, hmm. Hmm. so that will be repriced. Hmm. So there will be some gain then. ICICI has already been you know uh, doing well, so the credit growth is higher in ICICI Bank and HDFC Bank. So hmm. you've taken a this is a versatile. Hmm. Combination of both growth as well as valuations. Sure, sure. And uh, the last category, which is candidates that are vying to be uh, the strikers, what? Yeah. How do you describe that category? Are they so are they in some sense uh, the buy on dips kind of story? Uh, not necessarily. They are very stock specific. Hmm. So they will really, you know, I don't have a common theme for all of them. Okay. So among the large players, I have LNT there, which is probably one of the cheapest Nifty stocks, where the order flow has been very good, hmm. and it has two drivers. 
one is the oil price increase is increasing its uh, middle east orders and the second driver is its moving into renewables hmm. there it is making a lot of investments hmm. so among the large caps i have that then i have it players which are into more sir which is and which is not into exports hmm. so it's not going to be affected by the uh, 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 global uh, slowdown hmm. so i have map my india which is ci uh, info systems which is the right. leader in mapping services and i have cms info systems right. which is basically your cash management systems for banks so right. they have modes they are the leaders in their fields track record has been good they are gaining market share and year my month on month they have been increasing revenues so hmm. they are specific plays hmm. and then i have craftsman automation which is a levered play on the cd side hmm hmm and i have gateway display parks where you know if you see the the there is an increasing share of multimodal transport which is from uh, uh, road to rail hmm. and gateway district parks is in the most uh, is the is in the more profitable segments hmm. Hmm. compared to concord hmm. and the concerns <clears throat> are behind them so this is the one of those growth stocks so hmm. each of these stocks now apart from lnt all of these are uh, uh, mid caps hmm. hmm. so uh, mid caps do get hammered uh when the market is not good because ultimately uh, global inflows affect uh, your emerging markets play and therefore affect your fi flows into india because we right. are not big enough to have an india dedicated funds to right there allocation out of ems right so which is why you know mid cap suffer large cap suffer all of them will equally suffer so it's mm-hmm. a it's difficult to time when you'll be able to you know uh, play them hmm the uh, benchmark or the thumb rule is that at nifty 15000 you're basically it's at the uh, 10 year average hmm. and you you're going to be higher than that because your roe is higher hmm. and the 10 year average takes care of the first 5 years bear run as well as the next 5 years that will be in the recent 5 years bull run hmm. so you are there so 15000 i think would be sort of the bottom okay okay and if you were to just you know uh, take a clean slate and in today's market say uh, you are an absolute return investor what kind of cash uh, would you recommend for an hni it always because it's india a... is is so levered hmm. to a few factors hmm. its growth is so levered and the fact on the other hand unlike brazil etc etc which can tank completely in a bad time you cannot tank because you know you have de- you have demographic growth on your side hmm so which is why you have you know if you look at your nominal gdp growth this year it's 7% real gdp growth and nine, say 9% inflation so you have 16% nominal gdp growth right so your returns have to be more than that your stock market returns uh, a lot of it is due to inflation like the banking sector hmm. a, lot it, a lot of it is due to working capital you know loans so uh, you you're going to have uh, an inherent growth rate in india anyway so hmm. when times are bad it is it is in your uh, favor the odds are in your favor to invest sure if you got a you know good enough uh, perspective of 5 years unlike you know commodity countries etc which may tank hmm so with that perspective you should always keep 30% you know cash and deploy it in a bad time now how can i time the uh, how can i time it perfectly over the next 6 months hmm. you're going to have uncertainty hmm within that i have mentioned that the benchmark is 15000 right on right. that it's very difficult to time it so for right. a smaller investor it is better to you know wait for the turn to come for a institutional investor maybe it is better to wait for the 15000 uh, index or you can start averaging now sure sure and nandan uh, one thing we missed is the uh, is is commodities right they've had a phenomenal global commodities especially metals and all of that have had a phenomenal run and also some uh, moderation what is the sense that you get uh, out of that space i mean there are so there are three factors there one is the commodities both metals coal hmm. and oil have hmm. been you know going up even before the war hmm because of supply problems hmm so there has been under investment in capex in all three sectors hmm. across the globe hmm. and it has got even uh, in uh, in the case of energy it's got exacerbated by the fact that everybody is rushing towards green technology so that uh, financing has uh, dried up hmm. 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 so it's getting even worse hmm. so you have one factor which is the fact that there's a big supply problem supply squeeze and therefore there's a long term uh, 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 base to commodities 
The second issue in commodities is the fact that you know there's a global slowdown. So at least for the near term, there will be a problem in uh, you know in commodities. The third issue is that you have China, which is having its elections now to re-elect uh, Xi Jinping in November. Yeah. So they have already announced some easing in terms of duties, etc., on auto. And you do not know what you know. Chinese policy is inscrutable, hmm. so you do not know what other easing policies they will have hmm. in both fiscal terms as well as monetary terms. Because you know, even their fiscal policies are inscrutable because they can simply spend a lot of money on uh, low IRRs. Correct. So you don't know what they will do. Hmm. So metals might have a bounce up if uh, there's a massive easing of China of hmm. Chinese policy. So you have three un- imponderables. Hmm. Given that. Why should we invest in commodities? Because it's too uh, unclear. I've given you three different things. I've given you right. a long-term baseline of capacity squeeze, right. and I've got two near-term problems. One is the U.S. I mean, uh, the global eco problem, and the other is the China. This thing. So it is too much uncertainty. Right. Right. Having said that, you know, metals prices uh, of metal stocks and all are not high now. They've corrected a lot, and they're mm. already now. But it's a very difficult uh, sector to play in for a non-professional. Sure. these consumer internet companies i mean now valuations have uh, come off obviously from the listing prices but i think uh, the mistake we all make is get anchored to the listing price which is which should not be uh, a price that we should think about at all but at current prices um, uh, what is your take so our we uh, our analysts still don't have coverage on it so okay. i will not be able to give you a professional opinion uh personally we, what we are recommending is rather those companies which have moats like you know c info systems and cms info systems hmm. and also there is a company called apple which right. we are recommending these are all companies which have moats which are not that related to you know uh, finance tech or consumer tech which have been overvalued in the last one year hmm. both india in india and globally hmm. and if you see globally the prices are tanking so that will affect indian prices also so correct, even correct. after the correction that you've seen in the nasdaq yeah. you're seeing a correction continuing in consumer tech finance tech and other internet uh, related companies yes. that will continue to affect india for the present because you are not seeing ebitda uh, uh, or profit growth uh, being visible so for the present is going to be uh, uh, related to sentiments because from uh, a few quarters back to now Hmm. you're not going to get a far better uh, you know evaluation of the total addressable market it is what it is or of the you know the return to profitability hmm. that's still you know uh, quite some time away so there's nothing has changed in the fundamentals it's a sure. question of where you benchmark the valuations to sure sure and and then uh, just one last question are there any variables outside of all these individual stocks and uh, uh, uh you know their um, uh, specifics are there any key macro variables that you are watching uh, keenly to just get a sense of the direction of the market of course one is you know what happens to fed x so the market is very counter intuitive hmm. uh, uh, nowadays uh, so what happens to fed x and the us dollar hmm. so that is one number two Is is there going to be any slowdown in the SIPs? Nothing has happened so far. Touch wood. Hmm, hmm, hmm. But is there going to because the average SIP, from what I understand, hmm. is only five thousand rupees. Hmm. So it's a very negligible amount hmm. for an individual investor. Hmm. So I so just like you know, insurance money is like parked and nobody touches or nobody bothers yeah. to you know uh, move around their insurance uh, investments. Similarly, these SIPs. Hmm. It's unlikely that it will be touched, but who knows? Hmm. So that is hmm. the second thing to watch, which hmm. is that is there any fall in SIPs over the next few quarters? Hmm. Third thing to watch is is uh, uh, the RBI going to take any missteps and uh, uh, going to increase interest rates much more than necessary, which is very unlikely, hmm. because they also know that Indian inflation is not a demand problem like in the hmm. West; hmm. it is a supply problem. Hmm. So that is the third. Fourth. is what happens to rural recovery in india and therefore jobs in the lowest denominator hmm. because unless you have jobs in the lowest denominator you are not going to see capex you are not going to see fmcg growth you are not going to see a bigger share of wallets and so on hmm. because your smes have got hit so now uh, because of gst and because of uh, uh, so on a demonetization and all that and they are still to recover 
uh, um, some of them had recovered because of the increase in exports in the last few quarters. Right. But uh, that segment remains weak. Uh, uh, so rural recovery is something is a, uh, the other thing which uh, which I'm going to monitor. And the last thing is specific sectors. There are specific sectors like agro imports, hmm. construction. Your uh, uh, your uh, data centers, right? Uh, Realty. These are all different, different small, small sectors. Hospitals, diagnostics. Hmm. So all these small sectors have a very high trajectory of growth. Hmm. So those are uh, sectors, specific sub sectors which I keep watching. Sure, sure. How about? Uh, urban demand, especially in real estate, because that was again a big recovery story that the market has sort of discounted. Do you see any threat to that? Not at present. We see even the latest figures of all stamp duties across the states. Hmm. You, uh, you see the uh, the the latest report on Mumbai, on uh, the greatest uh, you know uh, the upliftment of the category of sub one crore housing. Hmm. It's the hmm. middle level. Hmm. If you look at that uh, throughout, you know, it seems still to go strong. Hmm. Urban realty is still going strong, and urban discretionary. Hmm. Uh, uh, if you break it up into consumer electronics and uh, the durables, hmm. ACs and all have been doing well because of the hot, the hot summer. Yeah. Uh, while the rest of it is because some of them are into exports, hmm. so they are they have been uh, you know uh, insulated from anything. And generally speaking, urban discretionary has been doing well. Hmm. The demand is still robust. If you see hotels hmm. sector, consumer durables in electronic sector, that is still not seen a great slowdown. Sure, that's all, uh, Nandan. It was absolutely wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Thanks, man.